Marcos broke cover and began leading his fire team towards the pass the 53rd were holding. To his right, he could see the main battle tank surging forwards towards the centre of the crater, running Covenant infantry down as they went, firing their turrets as fast as they could cycle at anything they could target. To his left, a rippling mass of Covenant troops were closing on their position. The southern staging area was moving in rapidly but was still back enough to give them a clear retreat from the area. Marcos focused on weaving his team in between the advancing 53rd. He'd never seen so much armour in one place. To his right, the thunderous main turrets of the Scorpions and Grizzly tanks fired so rapidly and so close together it began merging into a single deafening rumble that he felt in his chest. Wolverines fired volley after volley of ground-to-air missiles impacting the remaining cruiser's plasma batteries, while the Cobras continued peppering targets at long range with their main railguns. One of the lead tanks exploded in a flash of green plasma and fire, but more of the 53rd kept pushing forward. The green plasma round was much too large to be from one of the Covenant's handheld weapons. This was something much bigger. Another tank suddenly jerked and seemed to lift off the ground and roll onto its top, and then explode a moment after. As the smoke cleared, a massive 14-foot tall creature lifted its massive shield out of the ground and took aim at another tank and fired a huge bolt of green plasma at point-blank range, blowing the turret clean off of the tank and killing its occupants instantly. Hunters, Jay shouted. Keep moving, Marcos ordered, ignoring that every single bit of his body screamed at him to turn and fight with his fellow brothers in arms. The Covenant infantry closer to them began firing at them as they fell back to the pass. They kept running until Marcos heard the words he didn't want to hear. I'm hit, Jay screamed out in pain. Marcos turned and saw Jay fall to his knees, covering his head. In a split second, he scanned the area and saw the wreckage of one of the Cobras nearby still smouldering, but it was the only cover for 50 meters in any direction. He scanned for enemies, spotted a group of grunts being led by an elite and fired on them. Holding his weapon with one hand as he grabbed the armour at Jay's left shoulder and began dragging him towards cover. He was grimacing in pain, but that was a good sign. The plasma rounds from the grunts and elites began kicking up dust around them as their aim got better. Right as they got to cover, the covenant firing on them disappeared in a mist of blue fluorescent blood. One of the lockdown Cobras nearer the pass had fired its main 105mm railgun at the Hunter. The Hunter had expertly deflected the round with its massive, nearly impenetrable shield, only for the round to tumble erratically in the air and obliterate his comrades as they fired upon Fireteam Ares. Mitch, check Jay, we don't have long, Marcos ordered. Mitch dived to Jay's side and removed his helmet while the others kept lookout. Jay had taken a plasma bolt to the back right of his helmet. The round had torn through that side of his helmet and come out of the visor at cheek level. Mitch inspected the already cauterized wound running above his right ear to his cheekbone and sprayed it with a topical anaesthetic and disinfectant. Jay winced in pain and reflexively pulled his head to the left, exposing a laceration to the right side of his neck that was up until that point being compressed by his neck armor. It squirted a pulse of deep red blood, and Jay's hand came up instinctively to cover the wound. Shit, something inside your helmet must have blown downward. It's caught your carotid. I need you to keep pressure there. Mitch took off his medical tactical hard case and quickly opened it and grabbed a vial of bluish gel-like fluid and a sheet of biogorse. Right, Jay, listen to me. I can't use biofoam directly on the artery. That'll just block the flow of blood and you'll be whiter than Hamish last time he pulled. Mitch grabbed Jay's hand and removed it from the wound and shoved the biogorse into the wound under the torn flesh and wrapped it around the artery, lifting it slightly and squeezing it firmly so the gorse completely wrapped around the artery. Jay fell unconscious. Don't worry, he just blanked out. I basically knocked him out. He'll be back with us in a few seconds. Three grizzly main battle tanks rumbled past Fireteam Ares while they kept cover near the wreckage of the Cobra. They positioned themselves between the inbound Covenant forces and Fireteam Ares acting as a wall of metal armour and heavy artillery. Their turrets rotated and began unloading everything they had towards the Covenant. Charlie unit, what's your status? Van Collar required. Not good sir, the northern staging area fully engaging our position. We're pinned down between them and the... An explosion filled the comms, followed by silence. Charlie unit, respond, Van Collar asked. No reply came. Bravo unit, Charlie are down. We need to get the hell out of here right now if we don't want to end up the same way. Move to RV point Bravo immediately. Mitch squeezed the blue gel into the wound covering the biogorse. The gel took to the gorse and caused it to harden, creating a seal around the cut in the artery. 
Then he pinched the flesh together and squirted a small amount of biofoam into and around the laceration, and then gave Jay a hit of adrenaline. Jay came to his senses. Mitch took off his helmet. Right, I've applied some biogorse to the artery and some biofoam to the wound. We need to keep this compressed and as immobile and as protected as possible, so take my helmet and try not to scratch it. Jay tentatively adjusted the armour plates near his neck and reluctantly took Mitch's helmet. He pulled it over his head and it automatically sealed, applying appropriate pressure to the wound. Damn, you got a fat head, Jay groggily said. Thanks. How long is this going to hold? Your armour's gel layer will apply enough pressure to keep it protected and relatively immobile. The biogorse is good stuff. That'll keep you going for about a week, but you're going to need proper medical attention when we can get it. Right, let's get the hell out of this crater, Marcos ordered. Fireteam Ares stood and ran towards the pass, slipping past the friendly armour there and retreated towards RV Point Bravo at the edge of the new forest. Right as the 53rd announced the nukes were armed and planted, they didn't let up or look back as they continued running across the two kilometre expanse of scrubland between the crater and the RV Point. Beyond their IV point, past the forest, was Actium's capital city, and the location of the LZ for extraction. The remaining battlecruiser in position above the crater was firing its plasma batteries at targets unseen from their position. Troopers, be advised, the 53rd are cut off. They need a path cleared for their extraction. Van Collar spoke. Let's give them a hand. Negative Major, hostile activity too, the line filled with static and the sounds of gunfire. Too heavy for you to clear us a path. Get out of here, troopers. One way or another, we're ending this. I just need to get a little... The line filled with static again. The plasma batteries of the battlecruiser were creating bursts of electromagnetic interference. Colonel Mantieth, Van Collar asked, but the line was still filled with static. Troopers, keep moving to RV Point Bravo and hold for further instruction. Fireteam Ares slowed to a jog until they reached the edge of the new forest, where they stopped for a rest and assessed the situation. The band of scrubland between the crater and the forest was being crossed by what remained of the ODST forces in the area heading for this RV point. From just a glance, only about 60 of the 216 ODSTs dropped in had survived the engagement. After a few minutes, Hamish reunited with the fire team. It didn't look good. Right before I got clear, it looked like the 53rd had been surrounded. They were putting up a heavy defensive position, but it looks like... Troopers, Van Collar called the ODST's RV Point Bravo to his location, and in a somber tone said, Stand to for incoming transmission. The ODST's RV Point Bravo all stood and turned their attentions towards the crater. Many of the cruiser's plasma batteries had been disabled by ground fire from the 53rd, but it still fired its few remaining point defence weapons. Colonel Mentieth's voice suddenly snapped on as an open transmission. Let no one here question our place in human history. That we are here right now is not a coincidence or accident. No, Marcus whispered. It is our fate and this war, our birthright, our legacy. Jay scanned the area for any of the 53rd Armoured Division. He couldn't see any. The reality began to dawn on him, as it was for the other ODSTs who now stood fixated on the crater some slowly shaking their heads. Our generation was born to fight the Covenant, and you, my fellow soldiers, were born for this very day. Today, the enemy will hear the roar of humanity, and they will fear us. The area was saturated in a white light so powerful, even with closed eyes, it hurt. The ODSTs had averted their eyes for a few seconds until the blinding light had dimmed, when they looked back up, two huge mushroom clouds raised into the sky. The blast wave had indeed been angled upward by the crater's edge, but in parts the crater was falling. The shock wave blasted past the ODSTs, and the powerful double explosion rang out for twelve long seconds, echoing and gradually fading to the deepest silence any of them had experienced. The remaining battlecruiser had been caught with its shields down and was now just smouldering debris falling from the sky. The massive Covenant staging area and all the Covenant forces in it had been destroyed, but the entire 53rd Armoured Division were gone with them. The ODSTs continued to stand in silence. Gradually, one by one, they raised their right hand and saluted the fallen. A loud echoing bang suddenly sounded and for a moment 
Marcos thought another nuke had detonated until everything got suddenly darker rather than brighter. In the sky above the new forest, a CAS-class assault carrier had entered the atmosphere and come to a hover. The bang were the sonic booms caused by the massive five-kilometer ship coming to a stop. ODSTs find some cover, Van Collar ordered. Fireteam Ares turned and jogged into the forest edge and kept low. UNSC Edinburgh, this is Major Van Collar requesting immediate extraction from Actium. Covenant staging areas are neutralized. We are now retreating to the LZ. A Covey assault carrier is holding position above the area. We will radio when we are ready for dust off. Over. Just over a minute elapsed when finally... Major Van Collar, this is Captain Roberts. The Edinburgh is moving towards Actium as we speak. We will launch evac birds for you when we attain orbit. ETA to low orbit, 45 minutes. Right, we need to get to the LZ. Let's move, Van Collar said. The ODSTs turned and retreated into the forest, focusing on the waypoint on their HUDs and the distance counter above the marker as it gradually ticked down from 8 kilometers the closer they got to the LZ. They kept widely dispersed as they advanced. Above the canopy, they could hear the hundreds of Covenant ships, Phantoms, and Spirit dropships, Banshees, and Seraph fighters that were being launched from the massive assault carrier eclipsing the sun above them. They kept advancing until they came to a clearing where four Spirit dropships were hovering, the two-pronged, tuning fork-like forward-facing arms of the ship holding the troops inside. Their troop bay doors folded down, and out of the four dropships jumped a whole pack of Jurulhane led by a massive chieftain in golden, highly ornate armour, with a large double-horned helmet. These beasts were known as brutes to humanity, and they fit their namesake perfectly. Nine feet tall, rippling muscle, thick hairy hide, and an attitude to match. These creatures looked part gorilla, part hippo, very intelligent and prone to bouts of explosive aggression and rage, using their full weight and strength to overpower their opponents and literally tear them apart. Before the ODSTs had time to decide their course of action, the brutes began sniffing the air, and quickly changed their mannerism from cautiously at ease to battle ready. The booming voice of a chieftain barked orders in their native language to his subordinates. A moment later, the translation software in Marcos' helmet activated and a mildly synthetic but deep voice spoke. Spread out, you whelps. Find them. There are many of the pathetic creatures nearby. Do not let them escape. Van Collar's voice replied with a passive transmission, We do not have the time to be messing around with these guys. ODSTs, steer clear and move to the LZ quietly. The ODSTs broke off suddenly in different directions and gave the area a wide berth, while they navigated towards the LZ. But they had underestimated the creature's phenomenal sense of smell. The brutes had their scent, and were advancing through the forest in pursuit. It wasn't long until the inevitable happened. Major, this is Fire Team Dolos. We've got brutes on our six. An out of breath voice spoke over comms. They're closing on us. Keep moving for the LZ. We will engage and buy you some time. Dolos, is there any way to avoid engaging? Van Collar asked. Negative, they're on top of us. Fire Team Ares moved to assist. Negative, negative, we got this. Keep going to the LZ. Affirmative. Godspeed, Dolos, Van Collar replied. Marcos looked towards the back of the remaining ODSTs and saw Fireteam Dollos' IFF tanks disappear. He held a moment until Jay walked through the bushes nearby and strode by close enough to bump a shoulder with him, a gesture he wouldn't have done by accident. He was asking him if he was good. Marcos turned and continued moving, navigating his way under a mossy fallen tree trunk that had wedged itself between its broken stump and a rock outcrop. He opened a private comm. Stay focused, Fireteam Ares. It's not like Dolos to make the sacrifice play, Jay said. Agreed, but if we were in that bad of a way, their humanity had to win out eventually, right? Hamish questioned. Yeah, because they're shining examples of humanity, aren't they? Mitch joked. It's out of character, but... Kara paused. Where are they? Jay noted. I don't hear any gunfire. Marcos got a clear line of sight on a dozen of his fellow ODSTs for the first time since entering the wooded area. He listened carefully to his surroundings and could only hear bird call, the rustling of leaves and foliage, as he and the closest members of Fireteam Ares pulled themselves through the undergrowth. Nothing else. No fight. No gunfire. No screams or howls, just silence. He chose that moment to inform them. Their IFFs went off a few moments ago. Went off, as in KIA or switched off? Wasn't a KIA marker, Marcos replied. Something's off. 
Just keep moving forward, but stay alert. We don't know the situation back there. It could be completely above board, but better stay on guard, understood? We're two clicks from the LZ now. Acknowledgement lights winked green on his HUD. As Marcos refocused on the task at hand, the subsonic hum of a spirit dropship's engines grew louder. Spirits inbound, hold position, a voice spoke over comms. The canopy behind their position rippled as anti-gravity drive's area of effect passed above the tree line, causing them to compress and expand in rigid, unnatural ways, like the trees were alive and reaching for the ship. Only after they had passed did the natural sway come back to them, leaving them shaking in the wake of the ship due to the air displacement from the bulky crafts. The four two-pronged ships wailed as they passed above their heads at speed. They quickly pivoted and began strafing across the canopy top. Were these the same dropships from the clearing? Before Marcos could decide, he spotted the main plasma turret slung underneath the crafts pivot around and aim towards their position. Incoming fire, Marcos reflectively shouted. A second later, the dense forest erupted into chaos, as the ODSTs in their positions in and amongst the cover of the trees were suddenly caught in a hail of purple-blue plasma, splintering tree trunks, dirt, gravel, fire and black, ashy smoke. In the next few moments, the ODST scrambled for cover while the blood-curdling screams of their fallen brothers echoed through the forest. The forest around them was now ablaze and the floor was marked with molten glassy craters and charred bodies. The air stank of smoke and burning flesh. The spirit dropships held fire, their turrets scanning the area for movement then swiveled back into their default position. The crafts pivoted back into a forward-facing angle and accelerated further forward towards yet another clearing that ended in an abrupt drop-off of a limestone cliff face, stretching down 50 metres to the rest of the forest and the cityscape visible in the distance. This happened to also be their planned LZ, an extraction point. Troopers, spirits are moving to the LZ, they're trying to pin us between the fire and them. Move into a wide arc and find some cover near the clearing. Move! The ODSTs moved rapidly through the tree line with renewed vigour and into a wide arc that covered the LZ from all angles. Better to be ready for them to land than have them advance through the forest towards them. Sure enough, the spirit dropship's troop bay doors opened and the brutes jumped out. The ODSTs began firing, the dropship quickly lifted clear and accelerated away. The brutes howled in defiance as their thick hides and plate armour simply absorbed the incoming fire. Then they returned fire. From the clearing, a sea of 12-inch stake-like glowing projectiles lanced outwards. Marcos dived back into the cover of a tree as several of the spikes impacted the tree he was behind. When he popped back out to return fire, the far side of the tree was on fire. The spikes cooled from glowing orange to cherry red and had sunk half of their length into the tree. On his HUD, he watched as a dozen of his friendly units snuffed out, likely impaled by the massive projectiles. A few of the brute's armour plating failed and crumpled under the combined fire of the ODSTs. Marcos levelled his weapon and fired a sustained burst into a brute's stomach as the hulking creature closed with his position. The brute dropped to a knee, gripping his midsection, looked up at Marcos with glowing eyes of hatred, right as Jay fired his shotgun into its face. To his surprise, the brute recoiled from the shot but stood back up, bleeding badly from the face and abdomen. It took a large stride towards them both right as Hamish levelled his sniper rifle and fired a 50 cal round into its chest. The round passed straight through it and threw three of its pack brothers behind it. All four brutes simultaneously fell limp to the floor. The panicked screams of ODST sounded over the gunfire as something engaged them from behind. The thumps of a brute shot, a powerful handheld grenade launcher used exclusively by the hulking creatures, echoed from within the tree line. Amidst what sounded like particularly grotesque ways to be killed, the body of a living ODST was thrown back into the clearing, impacting the ground flat on their back, dislodging their helmet and knocking it free, and was followed by five brutes. Two of them wore gold armour, denoting them as captains, dragging a limp ODST body each. Two more wore a darkened silver armour with helmets that covered their eyes, and bore a large glowing red lens on the front signifying their rank as a brute stalker, particularly talented at active camouflage and stealth missions. The final brute was the massive chieftain. The two captains marched to the cliff edge and tossed the limp ODST bodies from the 50 metre drop. From Marcus's position, he saw Major Van Collar struggle back to his feet and realise his predicament now surrounded by the comparatively massive creatures. The gunfire on both sides began slowing. Hold your fire, Marcus shouted over open comm. Negative, Van Collar replied, engage. 
One of the captains stepped towards Van Cotter and punched him in the chest so hard Marcos could hear his ribs break from all the way back here. The blow crippled Van Collar to his knees and he tried to regain his breath, blood trickling from his mouth. The forest was now deathly silent, not even birdsong could be heard, just the distant rumble of the main engines of the massive ship hanging in the air and the sounds of very distant gunfire. The brute captain backed away as the massive chieftain snarled to his pack, staying their hands, and hushed the clearing into an even deeper silence. You humans hold so much respect for this one that you hold fire on your enemies, even when ordered to attack? The chieftain noted aloud, pacing slowly in front of Van Collar, his massive gold armor plate clinking together softly as he moved back and forth like a predator waiting for the moment to strike the killing blow, and then chuckled deeply to himself. He is your leader, your brave commander, he is the best among you. He chuckled again. Is this really the best you have? Where are your demons? They, at least, put up more of a fight. Slightly. The brutes, now standing still and scanning the forest for targets, laughed amongst themselves. Kyra started. How do they know he's quiet, Marcos bit? Well, if that is all you can offer, then you are not worthy of my respect. Let him be an example to all of you humans. The chieftain spoke, striding forwards. Van Collar turned to meet the chieftain's approach and lunged for it. He was caught short by the two brute captains who now restrained him, holding an arm each, their massive grip covering Van Collar's entire forearm. The chieftain hefted his gravity hammer high above his head. The ODST surged forward, all aimed squarely at the chieftain, and once their aim was clear they opened fire. The chieftain stumbled backwards under the fire, dropping his hammer while the captains loosened their grip on Van Collar. He took that moment to draw his combat knife and lunged again at the chieftain. Van Collar jumped into the air and plunged his knife into the chieftain's throat and twisted in a quick motion to try to cut the brute's throat out. It toppled to the floor right as the rest of the ODSTs fully engaged the remaining brutes. Van Collar fell to the floor on his knees. He tried to catch his breath, feeling his broken ribs shifting loosely in his chest. The sound of fighting around him faded until it seemed like a distant memory. The pain he felt began to ease his breathing slowed. Still on his knees, he looked up towards the sky, focusing on the patch of blue sky he could still see through his narrowing vision, and accepted his fate. The captain, who had punched him, had stepped forward, grabbed his arms, and literally ripped them from his torso. He felt numb as he watched both his dismembered arms tossed on the ground in front of him, and as he lost consciousness, he thought of his wife and child somewhere else on Actium. He hoped they were still alive. His vision dissolved into grey, and he felt the rising darkness take him.